Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 178 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can probably tell by my voice, I am a little under the weather, so this piece of it's going to be probably some low quality on the audio, but um, I'm just going to kind of get right to it. On the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle, uh, talked to him a lot about his functional strength coach six that I attended in Providence, Erin uh, McGurr from Perform Better. Uh, she will be talking about the holiday sale on the Mega Hex Bar. Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about lessons, lessons from Disney, uh, and that's for the business of fitness segment. Hit the gym with the train coach. I have the legendary Bob Alejo. We talked a lot about everything. The Art of Coaching with Exos. Kier Wenham Flat continues his three-part series. Frank Dolan continues his series on the functional movement screen. So uh, lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I am doing great, Anthony. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, it was great to see you on Saturday for Functional Strength Coach 6. Uh, Kevin Larrabee was uh, taping it. I know he was posting uh, the other day that he was uh, hard at work already editing it, so hopefully you guys will get that out soon. Uh, great job. Some new stuff in there with uh, uh, some of the Philip Beach work and some of the Anna Hartman stuff and, and how you're applying it. Also, I think uh, it was a great job on uh, on program design. You really got to the to the program design. I think the way you structured the whole thing with, um, uh, you know, starting with the why, and that was really the underlying uh, theme of of the, the lecture was starting with the why. And I, so I think, you know, it, it made everything really understandable. So good job on Saturday. Thank you. It, it was a lot of fun. Actually, I, I, and I said this while you were there, but I was really looking forward to that one more so than I have been in a while in terms of trying to, to look at some things really differently and to try to, to do things a little more in that Ted talk format where there was, less words in the slide. And, uh, and I think it went well, I, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm my own biggest critic. So every time I come home and Cindy always says, how did it go? And I'm like, eh, I think it was all right. And then I've been slowly getting feedback from people that it was good. And I think people always, always like them, but I'm always trying to, I guess, to keep delivering really good quality stuff for people. You, as we were talking about earlier, before we got on the air, I always want people to feel like there's really good value in what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, I think it was structured really well. And I think it's really, you know, anybody who has, who's not even familiar with your work could, could really get this as a standalone product. And then once you, you know, even if you've been around, if you've been, you know, following your stuff, it was great to kind of, you know, like I said, the Philip Beach stuff that Anna Hartman was going over and then really kind of really, you know, the starting with the why. And that, that's a question I'll, I'll start with today is, is, you know, we have these, uh, you know, why are why are you doing each one each area? You know why do you foam roll? Why do you do all this? What why do you do certain things in the warm up? Why do you do certain things with power and strength, etc.? Um, but I, like I was telling you, sometimes for me, I get a little discouraged because I don't have the exercise science um, background, and I might. I think a lot of times I I look at and that's what really first you know when I first read functional training for sports and core performance. I was just like, wow, these things. And I really didn't know what I was doing then. I was like, this makes sense. This makes sense to me. And I think, you know, that was my question to you the other day was, can that be good enough? Can I just, can I be an intelligent person who's seeing a an intelligent, experienced strength coach talk about what he's doing and say, that makes sense? Because I, you know, it does the other way around too. Sometimes I look at stuff and I'm like, ooh, that doesn't look good. I don't know if I would want to do that. Can can it make sense to me be a good enough why? I think so, yeah. I honestly think it can. Because I think part of it, sometimes I think people like you who maybe are, you know, might start out outside the industry, sometimes will gravitate to the smarter stuff first because they don't, they don't have any allegiance to sort of any particular lift or any particular style of training. Mm -hmm. You just look at stuff. And that was the biggest thing that I, when I first started with functional training for sports is I wanted people to understand this stuff just makes sense. When you think about unilateral training and you ask yourself, okay, why, 
why would I do that? And you go back to the most basic stuff. Well, because almost everything that we're doing happens on one leg. Okay, that from a why standpoint, that really makes sense. And I think all I did in some cases is is maybe fill in the blank better for people. Because as you said, you know, foam rolling really makes sense. You do it. I feel better. Stretching, it really makes sense. You do it. You feel better. But I think to sometimes then go back and say, yeah, and guess what? There's some really good science here, or in some cases, some really bad science that said don't do it. And so I think that's all I'm trying to do for guys like you is just fill in that blank better and more clearly so you look at it and think even more. So I wanted everybody to leave that seminar to think the way they train at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning really makes sense. Mike Boyle has a, there's a why for everything that they do. He can see any, there's not one thing that they're doing that he's going to say, it's not going to give you some dumb internet reason or, oh, that's the way the real men do it. Or, oh, that's the best lift that you can possibly do. You're not going to hear anything that you, you kind of look at and think, uh, I don't know if that makes sense to me. Hopefully when they walked out of there, everybody that walked out of there walked out and thought, well, you made a, you made a pretty good case. It's almost like, they feel like it's almost like going to court sometimes where you're, Okay, you know, I've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that I'm right. And that's really what I was trying to do. And hopefully you do it in a funny way and in a way that entertains people, but at the same time, in a really convincing way. So someone walks out of there and doesn't think, well, if I wasn't foam rolling before, I'm going to now. And if I didn't have my client stretch, I'm going to now. And if I'm not doing power training this way, I'm going to now. If I don't, if, you know, in my core training, if I'm not, you know, if I'm doing a lot of flexion, I'm not thinking anti-extension and anti-rotation, then I'm going to now. And so I think that's the stuff that, that you hope comes across in a seminar like that. And really, I think it's aimed more at guys like you. Because I would hope, and this is, I, I guess maybe this is the eternal optimist to me, I always think the educated person should get it right away. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. That's exactly the way it should be. And it shouldn't take any convincing. We all know that that's not the case, unfortunately. But that's the way that it should be. I feel like everybody who's done their reading, done their studying, should agree with me. <laughs> but that's pretty typical of how I think, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, you always make the point. It's like, look, Mike, you know, what's a better, uh, you know, what's the best way to do this? Well, the best way to do it is the way I'm doing it because I'm, I'm constantly trying to find the best way. And I think I've found it at the moment. So that's why, you know, if you think I change my mind a lot, it's because I'm trying to learn and, and do what's best for my athletes, my clients, et cetera. So, you know, and I think... Like, even if, if Thomas Myers and Stu McGill and everybody in the world, the great cook, said, you know, foam rolling, it's looking like we're getting some research that foam rolling's really not doing much. I wouldn't care because I get on the foam roller before a workout. It's not, I'm not on it for 10 minutes, but I do a few things through my hips, my thoracic spine. It feels good. I feel prepared. And I think that's a huge thing when it comes to warming up. It's why we can, you know, there's been studies that said, you know, warming up has no effect on injury prevention, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I think if you, if you, if you make the warm up, if you feel prepared with, you know, what you're doing and it makes sense to you, I, I think that's okay. So, uh, it's, it's right, but I also think when, when you look at those concepts, when you start looking at ideas like creep and you start looking at Myers talking about lock, short, lock, long, sometimes I think what happens is these, I would hate to say, but some of the guys like, uh, you know, and I was talking about not disagreeing with the intelligent people, but you know, Myers or McGill or even Greg Cook or some of these guys. They're not really day-to-day -day practitioners in our field. Yeah. So I don't know if they necessarily see it the way that we see it. You know what I mean? I think that they see things out of a slightly, maybe not even slightly different lens, maybe a really different lens than what we see. Because we don't have the tools. You know, Myers, obviously, does hands-on work work better? Yeah, absolutely. Would I love to have Thomas Myers rolling all my guys? Absolutely. But if I get 300 people today and I want to get some sort of soft tissue work, is foam rolling a bad idea? I'm going to have, you know what I mean? I'd really have trouble with the idea that foam rolling is a bad idea. If foam rolling may not, you know, it may not actually change tissue. You know, that's the stuff we don't know. You know, is it changing tone? Is it actually changing tissue? What's going on? But as you said, we do know that it's working. And there seems to be some things in the, in the science that tells us a little bit about why it's working. So um, I think, and that's where, you know, you talk about the stuff, you know, when, when Anna came and talked, it was the same thing where you go, oh, this makes, 
that makes perfect sense. Just the, the initial statement are from Beach's idea about, you know, these postures, and the body may be not recognizing it's at rest if we don't go to these sort of resting postures that are embedded in our psyche. You kind of sit there and think, you know, that, that makes a little bit of sense. And then you start to get into the, well, if I gamble five minutes on this thing, then I lose a lot. It was the, in the rocks idea, you know, again, the science, walking on rocks. And it's not necessarily walking on rocks, it's walking on something, rough surface. But, and the idea at the bottom of your feet are connected to your low back, that stuff, again, that's what we talked about. There's some why there. And so I felt like, you know, Anna did the most, one of the most convincing and enlightening presentations that I've seen in a while. And that's why, you know, I mean, in reality, I mean, I went up and kind of, whatever, adapted, stole. <laughs> I mean, we talked about that idea, steal smart people's stuff, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. So I'm, yeah. uh, I'm right in the, I'm right in the throes of it. And you know, we, not like you're not giving credit. I think that's the only, that's the problem we have with some people. Right. But, you know, you put out a single leg training DV and then all of a sudden, you know, you get, trainers oh single leg training is great here's my new dvd you know uh and and then you don't get credit for like an idea anyway um coach let's say on anna hartman now our time is valuable we have an hour let's say we have 55 minutes we have 45 minutes um sometimes you have 90 minutes but i know your whole workout is structured you've done this before and talked to us about how much time you're going to be in each section have your thoughts you know, with Anna's info, how much has that changed your idea about the warm up? Because we you know if anybody has watched the presentation on Body by Boyle, she was like, "Oh, forget the warm up." You know, uh, you know, maybe she felt like that way. She was in Arizona, and you know, people were warm, and so for her, it was. She felt the if you have X amount of time, I'd rather see you do five minutes of these resting postures at the end of the workout because it's gonna signal the body to say we're shut down. Give us your thoughts on that kind of program design logistics based on uh, this beach Hartman info. As I said, really what it did is it, I think it changes our stretching. So we changed to some different quote unquote stretches, the resting postures, even in the beginning as a teaching tool to get people to understand what we want them to do. Then at the end we can say, okay, I need you to go back through these positions. And the one thing we found is particularly the athlete who's fatigued will very easily go through those positions again for you when you're done because they just want to sit or they just want to lie. And so if you just say, hey, all I need you to do is sit foot to foot, sit cross-legged, try to get in a half lotus, try to sit in that Z-sit or the Spina kind of 90-90 position. Just do those things for me while you're recovering from whatever we did for conditioning. And that ends up working out really well. So I, I don't think that was one of the things that I liked. Is I felt like there was a fairly simple way to make an adjustment that wouldn't be all that drastic. Yeah, yeah. And then again, another thing is, uh, like I said with you and Anna, Anna is that, uh, you know, this, this idea of it's easy homework. So it's easy to say, go home and yep. sit this way or sit that way, uh, take a couple of these positions. Um, yeah, exactly. It, it's really like I even find even, and again, I might bastardize it a little bit, but I've got a big couch that I'm sitting on right now, and I'll sit cross-legged on my couch. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit foot to foot even on my couch. And again, is that, should I be on the floor? Maybe, yeah. Sorry, my, my dog's having a little wrestling match here in the background. <laughs> I can hear him growling. It's not my wife getting mad at me. But um, there's... um. So even that type of stuff, and, and the thing that I'm saying, and the reason I said it so much at the Functional Stuff Code 6, is I am clearly feeling better. There is mm -hmm. no doubt in my mind that I'm feeling better. And that, as you said, that's the common sense thing. And, you know, I think we've had that conversation with Alan Costco with a lot of people when we talk about stretching, we talk about rolling. When you've got, when people come to you and say, how do I buy those roller things? That's pretty convincing because you didn't try to sell them one. I've never tried to sell somebody a roller, ever. And I can't tell you the number of people that I know that have asked me for catalogs. How do I get one of those roller things? <laughs> the same way with massage sticks. And that's pretty – when you talk about sort of the social proof stuff, 
that's pretty heavy social proof when you start looking at that and realizing, okay, somebody came to me after foam rolling and immediately said, hey, I want to buy one of these. That tells you that they're feeling yeah. what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, Coach, a little bit on the program design and the progressions, regressions. Uh, I wasn't able to ask this question the other day, I don't think, but, um, you know, the core, some of this core work that you do, and you talk about anti-rotation, um, and so one thing, and you talk a lot about the 4 by 4 matrix, so, you know, on, on, on the floor, then, in, uh, you know, uh, quadruped position, half kneeling, and then standing. This is from, for anybody who doesn't know the 4 by 4 positions. The core, Gray has said, the core is activated differently in different positions. So... Should we start looking at some things, not as progressions and re regressions, but more like from a holistic pr approach in our program design? So almost to say, okay, for a core, we should do a plank because it's kind of that idea on the ground. We should do uh, some chops because it's in the half kneeling position, uh, maybe some crawling. It's in the, in the quadruped position and then some carries because now we're standing up. Should we really start to look at this as not progressions and regressions, but because the core is activated differently in different positions, should we start to think, I need to make sure, not, not like so much like, you know, uh, knee dominant, hip dominant, upper body push, upper body pull, but should we start to break down some of this core work as well? Um, I don't think so because I think what happens sometimes is you, you'll go, and this, I think that was the woman who said, why not go to the hardest stuff right away? And I think you'll go to stuff too fast. I think there are certain things because I think sometimes when we're warming up, we're doing core. If you look at sort of our FMS warm-up stuff, if we're doing leg lowers, then we're doing core and we're doing it in that supine position. If we do some crawling, then we're doing core and we're doing it in the quadruped position. And then, you know, for us in our phase one stuff, we'll be in half kneel doing a lot of stuff in those diagonal positions. We'll also be doing maybe some squatting stuff in warm up where we're going to be in two leg stance. So I think we are throughout the program exploring yeah. all of those stances anyway. And then I think if you don't, I think it's tough if you said, hey, I want to go right to standing lift or standing chop. I think some of the things just lend themselves to teaching progressions and learning progressions. And, and maybe it might be a situation where you say, hey, it might take me 12 weeks to really impact this person's core the way that I want to. But I would be okay with that in terms of working my way through because I do think the progressions as they occur naturally, if you talk about just sort of half meal to lunch to stand, it, it also makes for very good teaching progressions in terms of learning exercise. Yeah. So I think there's... um there's kind of like, it's almost like there's double benefit. And then there's some areas where you think, oh, we're getting that anyway. We may not be. And that's why I said, sometimes we're looking at uh, mobility, this whole idea, mobility activation, dynamic warm up, core. And you kind of get into that situation of saying, okay, well, what do I, what do I, what do I call that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's that exercise? Yeah. And, and you're like, well, uh, that's a mobility exercise. And let's just say we're looking at active straight leg raise and saying that we're doing active straight leg raise because we want to work on that that pattern. But the reality is there's a core component to that pattern. There's a mobility component to that pattern. There's a flexibility component to that pattern. And it sort of falls, you know, we end up in that, well, yeah, check some, check some boxes, all of the above. Yeah. And I think that's why sometimes with a lot of these exercises, you know, you look at an exercise like a floor slide or a wall slide kind of thing, and you say, okay, breathing, scapula control, core control, rib position. It's like, yep, check, 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 check. We're getting all of that stuff while we're maybe getting some flexibility in our internal rotators and some activation in our external rotators. So I think sometimes the best warm-up exercises, quote-unquote, end up checking a lot of boxes for you. And they will bring you, as I said, from, you know, some will be supine, some will be, you know, we could be quadruped doing bird dogs or quadruped hip extension. And we could be hitting, you know, we could be doing squat to stand. All that might be part of the phase one warm up. And then maybe from a strength standpoint, chop and lift might start in half kneel. And, and you still say, okay, well, then we addressed half kneel too. Yeah. So if you kind of look at the whole workout and said, all right, I'm going to circle or I'm going to label postures, you'd realize that you probably did go through 
all those postures. Yeah, and I was also feeling like, well, I guess maybe the question should have been posed about, you know, phase three, phase four. Does that warm up change or does, you know, do we throw out the plank? Do we throw out the half kneeling chops? Because yeah, and that's we've what happens. Been there. We throw, we exactly, we throw out the plank. But what I, one of the things I said, and that's what I talked about in um, functional training, the new functional training sports that I just rewrote, is you realize that as you progress planks, any of the plank variations that we use, plank rows, plank reaches, clock planks, any of that stuff, they all become anti-rotation exercises. So suddenly something yeah. that, you know, it starts out as anti-extension, but as soon as you move to three points, it becomes an anti-extension and an anti-rotation. So in reality, you realize, again, you're checking two boxes at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's actually better as you as you move sure. and you get more advanced. That's, in fact, what you want. So sometimes I think when you've got your more advanced clients, you can just think, okay, if I do some plank reaches, I don't have to worry about anti-extension and I don't have to worry about anti-rotation because I just got both of those in that one exercise as opposed to thinking – now I need, to, you know, I need to do an anti-rotation press or I need to do a plank. Yep. I think the more we can combine them, the better they are. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, as long as we don't start out with that and say, well, we're getting our bang for our buck. Now you got to start, start at right. the beginning. Right, and then that's where you end up with ugly shit. You know, sometimes yeah. you look at people and their butts up in the air and they're wobbling back and forth. And we still get that at MBSC sometimes. But they're not ready for that. Yeah. You know, we need, we need to get plank. We need to really get good at plank before we can worry about plank reach because we're not ready for plank reach. Yep. All right. All right, Coach. Um, thank you so much. want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Have a great holiday because we're going to talk to you after Christmas. So uh, have a great holiday. All right. Okay. I hope everybody else has a great holiday, too. I'm sure most everybody will hear this before. So I want to thank everybody that listens and thank everybody that goes on Strength Coach and does everything else. So been a good year all right now it's time for the ask the equipment experts and i'm here with the queen of the hex bar erin mcgur erin thanks for coming on today <laughs> thank you for having me all right everybody will get that joke in a little bit a little while erin just yeah. i want to say by the way i was up at uh i was in your hood i was uh very close to your desk. Saturday, you weren't there, unfortunately, mm-hmm. for FSC number six. Got to see your gym. Holy cow, beautiful. That gym is gorgeous that you guys have yeah, it's, at it's your facility. Yeah, it's nice. We are spoiled here. <laughs> guys, man, you guys should all be jacked now. You know, I am. I just That's why I can't have anyone see me yet until, you know, a couple, couple more weeks because I don't want anyone to get nervous. All right. Um, yeah, that was really, what a beautiful gym. You guys did a great job up there. Um, all right, cool. Well, you know, it's holiday season. Remind everybody, what is the holiday sale? Well, the holiday sale is still going on. It's going to be going on until the end of the month. Um, because you can't just end it when Christmas is over. That's just not right. Mm -hmm. But, um, we have a sale for up to 40% off certain items. And we also have free shipping on select products for orders over $49. So there's not many shopping days left, which somebody brought that to my attention yesterday. So Amazon Prime has become my new best friend. That and everyone's getting Perform Better equipment that I have here. Um, but mini we have for everybody's <laughs> sake. Exactly. Everyone's getting mini bands and super bands for Christmas from me. Um, but they are on the they are on the holiday sale, so um, we have all sorts of bands on sale, like you said, mini bands, super bands, cook bands. We have agility ladders, Airx pads, kettlebells, old Smith sandbags, jungle gyms, uh, rings, ropes, rollers, tiger tails, and then, like I mentioned last time, we even have some of our larger equipment, such as our half rack, our PB Extreme benches, foam plyo boxes, and hex bars. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, you know what? You got a new hex bar. We're used to the old Olympic combo hex bar that you guys have. Um, and uh, there's some really cool features. And I think everybody who has used the hex bar, you know, sometimes you kind of you, you run out of room on that sleeve. So tell us the differences <laughs> with this new and it's heavier, too. So give us some of the uh, the highlights of this new. What's it called? It is called the Mega Trap Bar. Mega, I love it. <laughs> Original. Original, but um, we we were getting a lot of requests. Obviously, we've had the Olympic hex bar around for a very long time. Um, it's actually the brainchild of Al Gerard, in case you didn't know that. But um, the Olympic hex bars 
good, but the biggest problem we are running into, especially with the larger athletes and people who have been deadlifting for a while, who are very strong like myself, um, we were running out of room on the sleeves for adding weight and just needed something bigger, a little heavier. People were kind of maxing out. So we finally came across the Mega Trap Bar, which is great for the larger and stronger athletes. It is a lot bigger than the original hex bar. So um, the sleeves, I can start with comparing the sleeves. On the regular hex bar, the sleeves are 10 inches long, so you have 10 inches to add your plates. But on the Mega Trap Bar, they are actually 20 inches long. So it's double the length on the sleeves. It still has the raised handles. The inside is a little wider. So for bigger people, instead of being around 23 inches, it's now 25 inches. Um, the weight is actually a big difference. The original regular Olympic hex bar is 45 pounds, where the new Mega Trap bar is 85 pounds. So not only are you able to add a lot more weight plates, but now you can really test your strength because the bar is almost double the weight to begin with. So um, it's just something that we were getting a lot of requests for. We were really trying to get people to um, find a better solution. I know some people were putting on weight vests to try and do deadlifts, and it's just not the same. Um, so this was kind of the solution that made a lot of people very happy. But like I said, it is a lot longer. It is a little wider. And the sleeves are a big difference, and the weight's a lot different. So for yeah. all those people out there that were looking for, you know, an alternative solution or something to really add more weight to their deadlifts, now there is no excuse. Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah, and exactly. Just the bar alone, it's another 40 pounds right there. And then obviously more having more room, certainly uh, more room on the sleeve gives you more. You know, another thing is, you know, if you, if you pick that thing up and you drop it, um, it's not like dropping a regular barbell. So it's it's a little, you know, you have a little more room. It's a little safer because when you drop the hex bar, sometimes it'll move and you're, you know, you're in danger of it hitting you. So very cool. The mega hex bar uh, with the queen of the hex bar deadlift, Aaron McGurr. Aaron, thank you so <laughs> much for coming on. Uh, we'll talk to you uh, after Christmas. So have a great Christmas and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. You as well. Hi there, welcome to The Art of Coaching with Exos. My name is Keir Wenham flatt and I am the Exos strength coach responsible for training the Argentinian National Rugby Union team. This is part two of a three-part series in which we'll be discussing the three pillars that make up the program of preparation uh, that we deliver to the Argentinian rugby players. Um, in part one, we introduced the idea of training the central nervous system, the neuromuscular system, and the metabolic system. We basically said that the neuromuscular system represents the, the total force production capacity of the body, and the CNS represents the ability of the body to tap into that and apply it in the most effective manner. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how we increase that capacity via training the neuromuscular system. That is uh, the skeletal muscles and the, the nerves that feed into those. And a great starting point for this discussion is the force velocity curve which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, basically describes the ability of the body to apply force against a, a source of resistance at varying movement speeds. And we know that, obviously, at the very left-hand side of, of the force velocity curve, we're able to apply most force against uh, resistance when we have a negative velocity, that is, eccentric strength. Um, then, obviously, we're able to apply a little bit less force in isometric strength when the velocity is zero, um, a little bit less force when we're moving at the, the very, very limit of our ability in, in maximal strength. Um, as we move into the middle of the force velocity curve with strength speed, max power, and speed strength, we're applying uh, as much force as possible against a moderate source of resistance, and so it's a little bit lower. And eventually, as we get to the right-hand side of the force velocity curve with speed and reactive strength, um, eventually we're moving so fast that it's impossible for us to produce any more force against that source of resistance. And that's why we have this declining relationship or declining ability of the body to apply force against a source of resistance as we move from the left to the right. Now, in a game like rugby, it's an extremely unpredictable environment, as we said in part one. Sometimes players are going to have to perform different skills that they're not normally required to do. And for that reason, we try and develop all regions of the force velocity curve earlier in the athlete's career and earlier in the preparation to ensure that they're adequately prepared to be able to do this. 
And obviously, we're going to concentrate a lot on the development of maximal strength within our program. This is because we know from research that the development of maximal strength is going to benefit all areas of the force velocity curve, particularly in the earlier stages of the career or the preparation of the athlete. However, once we start to get to the intermediate stages of the career, uh, the body becomes less and less sensitive to this transfer from maximal strength to all areas of the force velocity curve. As we get older, we transition from focusing more on the development of maximal strength to the development of the middle of the force velocity curve, focusing on strength speed, max power and speed strength. This is because the majority of what we do as rugby athletes lies in the middle of the force velocity curve and we have to be cognizant of the need to produce maximal force in minimum time because we know that the contact time available to produce force uh, does not change between elite and sub-elite athletes. And thus, if we want to increase uh, performance, we must increase force rather than the time in which we apply force. The last thing we do, which for us is the icing on the cake, is to focus on the region of the force velocity curve that we feel most corresponds to an athlete's position on the field of play. We look at the movement characteristics and we train the CNS in terms of that. And we look at the force characteristics and we train the neuromuscular system in terms of that. And this is going to give them the specialization that they need to excel within their position and distinguish themselves from other athletes on the field. Now, another important thing that I'd like to talk about, which doesn't necessarily come under uh, neuromuscular factors, but will have a significant impact on the ability of the athlete to produce force, is other physical qualities like stiffness, uh, tissue quality, speed of relaxation, stretch potentiation, mobility and stability. And the reason I'd like to talk about these is because sometimes I think that as strength coaches, we get sucked into the paradigm of only thinking about how much force we produce rather than uh, other qualities which may be a limiting factor in how well an athlete is able to uh, apply the force that they do have. Uh, for example, uh, by being stiffer, we can increase force production during ground contact time of running and jumping. Or by having uh, enhanced mobility, we're going to be able to get ourselves into mechanically more advantageous positions. Or by uh, learning how to potentiate the stretch reflex, we get an additional boost in, in force output that we would not be capable of producing had we not trained it. So these can actually be quite significant limiting factors in the ability of the athlete to produce force. We have to try and remove these as much as possible to fully express force. And when we consider that these qualities actually get left by the wayside by a lot of coaches, it can potentially offer a far greater return on the investment of training time and effort in the improvement of performance. So for this reason, we concentrate just as much on these types of physical qualities as we do the development of the force velocity curve itself. That will do for today. And in part three next week, we're going to be discussing how we train the metabolic system to be able to fuel this activity and fully express force on the field of play. Thanks very much. Hey guys, welcome back to the Business of Fitness segment here on the Strength Coach Podcast. My name is Alan Cosgrove, coming to you live. That's live. That's not even live. I'm recording it live, but you're here now. Hey. Anyway, I digress. Today's lesson is about from coming from Disney. Disney, the happiest place on earth. Uh, if you study business in a geek-like, fanatical way like I do, you will be aware that Disney has just increased the price of their annual pass by 120 bucks. It's now $649. That is on top of a 9% increase over the last year, too. So it's went up just fairly dramatically, right? It went up, you know, close to 50% uh, <coughs> over the, the last couple of years. See, Disney had a problem. The problem was there were too many people getting these annual passes and coming at peak times, which for them is things like not spring break, uh, Christmas vacation, stuff like that. So they used what they call a two-step solution, or what I call a two-step solution. <coughs> they increased the price of their premier option. And you still get everything, but now it costs more. And their other chance was to offer a lower price option and in their case, it has more blackout dates. There's, more, there's less available dates. So it's a tiered pricing based on demand, right? And now we know that, that airlines do this. Your flight will cost more around Thanksgiving. Hotels do this. Like a, you know, New Year's Eve in Las Vegas is going to be a little more expensive than you know, uh, another time. And even uh, Uber, the new uh, taxi uh, service, does this. But they call it surge pricing. That if you're if the uh, it's busy, prices automatically go up. So you know we can't really do that based on peak time, or can we? Could we have an off-peak membership? So the idea is not that it's a peak time membership, 
you have an unlimited membership for people who come whenever they want, and maybe you have a restricted hours membership, right? Uh, so tiered membership offerings are another way to do it. So Results Fitness, we offer two primary options. One is what we call our Essentials membership, which is our group only membership, which is our large group training. Our members get unlimited classes with that. And then we have our elite membership. Uh, so our elite membership is you get two semi-private training sessions per week, right? So 104 in the year. And you also get unlimited classes, right? And from that, which has actually become our most popular membership, we have an upgrade to unlimited training sessions with coaches, right? So if you want to come in every day and have a coach, I have that available to you. Right? But I also have a more restricted membership, which is our, our group classes. So here's how you can apply it to your business. Maybe you have a, a boot camp class on a Saturday morning. Maybe there's a membership that only gets you access to that class. Maybe you have a membership that gives you unlimited classes, one that gives you access to semi-private. Or maybe you have a program design membership where someone can get a program from you and maybe one session per month, one or two sessions per month, to learn the program, and then they can train on their own and come back to see you, right? So the idea being here is that Disney use a different price structure based on peak times, right? If you want to get an annual pass, it's going to cost you more if you want no blackout dates. But they have one that's a little limited for, you know, the peak times are, are not available for you to use your pass, right? We could offer that as a, an off-peak membership. Maybe in the afternoons you have a class and a membership only includes that class maybe you have one on a Saturday and maybe you just have different options for what you're doing so that's the lesson from Disney it is on tiered membership offerings right because basically that annual pass at Disney is just a membership right so tiered membership offerings have a high priced option that gives you everything you want it's your premier option it's everything everyone wants but it's going to be high priced that's your, your elite offering and then offer a lower priced option, but it has less stuff in it, right? It's a good deal, it's a solid program, but you don't get everything, right? That's it for this week. Uh, that's the resultsfitnessuniversity.com business of fitness segment here on the Strength Coach Podcast. Uh, my name is Alan Cosgrove, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Hi, this is Frank Dolan for the Functional Movement System segment. I'll be continuing our series on the FMS Basics a review of the functional movement screen fundamentals. For this segment, I'll be discussing shoulder mobility. We're going to discuss some of the verbal instructions, some tips for testing, the scoring criteria we're looking for, as well as some of the nuances that are often missed, the common questions and mistakes that we see. So to start out, we'll talk about those verbal instructions and making sure the script is always the same, using those same uh, words for the instructions so that we have consistency and reliability in the test. We're going to ask that the client make sure to let us know if they have any pain with the movement to start. We'll then ask them to stand tall with their feet together and arms hanging comfortably at their sides. We'll have them make a fist so that their fingers are around their thumbs and in one motion place the right fist over the head and down your back as far as possible while simultaneously taking your left fist up your back as far as possible. We're going to have them ask them to not creep their hands closer after the original uh, initial placement and ask them if they understand the instructions. We're just going to use the dowel to measure the distance between the, the uh, knuckles of the hands. Some of the tips for testing that we want to take a look at is that we are scoring the side of the top shoulder. So when we put the score on our scorecard, the top shoulder is the side we're scoring. Doesn't necessarily mean it's that side's problem, but we want to make sure that we're scoring the same side for everybody. If the hand measurement is the same as the distance between two points, score low. So we want to, that goes saying with most of the tests that we want to make sure when in doubt we score low. Uh, we want to make sure the client does not try to walk the hands towards each other following the initial placement. So you can see sometimes people will bend their back and creep the hands together, or uh, even if they just place it in one position and creep them together, that's no good. We want them to repeat that. Uh, we then want to have them uh, repeat the test on the opposite side. So I'll quickly go over the other little piece of this test, which is the shoulder clearing test. 
This is uh, the first test in the FMS that has a clearing test. Uh, in this one, we're just going to really quickly check and make sure that they don't have pain with this one specific movement. So we'll have them stand tall with their feet together and arms hanging comfortably, just like they did in the shoulder mobility test. They'll place their right palm on the front of their left shoulder. So whichever hand, uh, arm they're doing, we're going to have them place that hand on the opposite side shoulder, keeping their palm flat. So while maintaining palm placement, raise the right elbow as high as possible. And then ask them the question, do you feel any pain? In this case, if we do have pain here, they may have a perfect three on the actual shoulder test and still have pain with this movement, it's still a zero. Uh, we're going to make sure that they can perform and try this on both sides, checking for the actual score, three, two, or one, or if they have pain with the actual movement, would be a zero, and then we'll actually have them go through the clearance test on both sides. The scoring criteria for the shoulder mobility test is that to get a three, we want to have the fists fall within one hand length. So prior to the test, we take a measurement from their dominant hand. So we're going to take a look at their righty, take a look at their right hand. We're going to measure from the distal wrist crease to the end of their middle finger. That's going to be our hand length. If their fists can fall behind their back in that test between that length, then it's a three. If they fall outside of that length, then we're going to look at either a two or a one. So outside of that length, it could possibly be a two. If it's outside of that hand length and a half, then it's going to be a one. So it, this is really just a, a quick measurement between the two fists to check and make sure that they're either falling within one hand length, a three, two is outside of that hand length, but within one and a half hand lengths, and then a one is if they can't get within one and a half hand lengths. If an individual scores uh, has pain with this movement, it's going to be a zero. Uh, and then we will take a, take a quick test of the clearance, palm on the shoulder, lifting the elbow, does it hurt? A couple of things that we see, some of those nuances that are often missed, is that sometimes people don't instruct their client to have their feet together. Uh, sometimes they allow them to bend over. That's no good. We don't want them to bend over and be able to get their hands closer in that. Sometimes you'll see people do this really fast and they can get further with that. So watch the speed, make sure they're doing it at a slow pace. And they sometimes will do the shoulder clearance first. Let's just try to keep the consistency and reliability of the test by doing it the same every time. We're going to have them do the shoulder mobility test, and then do the clearance after the test. Next time we will discuss the active straight leg raise. For now, this was shoulder mobility. And for more information, you can check out functionalmovement.com. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach. And today I have on the legendary train coach, Bob Alejo. And Bob is the assistant AD. He's also the director of strength and conditioning at NC State. Um, he's also been director of strength and conditioning for a while at the Oakland A's back in the day. He was with UC Santa Barbara from 2005 to 2008. Worked with the uh, 2008 U.S. Olympic team um, gold medal win winning men's volleyball beach team. He was also the strength and conditioning coach at UCLA where he worked with 23 men's and women's teams. While he was there, the Bruins racked up 25 national championships and produced more than 100 All-Americans. He's also a a great contributor for us at strengthcoach.com. Coach Leo, thanks so much for coming on today. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. It's been uh, too long. I'm excited. I'm excited to see if I can't answer some of your uh, questions about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and where this place is going. Yeah, like I said, with your resume, I mean, you've done, you've been in pro sports, you've been working with college teams, you've worked with volleyball, specifically, you know, we're just working with the guys you've worked with, uh, you know, many teams when you're at UCLA, many teams at UC Santa Barbara. Um, talk to us about your role now, because, you know, you're you're also, now you're, you're the assistant athletic director as well, and you're not just working, you, you're, you, you work with the day-to-day -day operations with basketball, but you're overseeing other strength coaches, so tell us about your role right now. Well, I'm the, I'm the director of strength and conditioning, so I have a, a staff of 13, I have nine full-time and four paid interns, and you know they're all coaches, and five dedicated to football, and that puts uh, eight on the Olympic side. Uh, my primary responsibility is men's basketball. I do work with the sprinters a little bit. Um, but, you know, having begun my career working with so many sports at UCLA was it was infectious and it spoiled me. It's hard for me not to, to be involved or, or somehow look at or 
talk about certain things for all the sports, so I, I, I try to keep my hands as much as I can in it without micromanaging. That's something I know I don't, I wouldn't like to be done to me, and my guys do a terrific job, but uh, I, I do still want to stay involved a little bit. But really, it's just it's just administrating our unit, setting the vision, and uh, letting everybody else kind of carry out that vision. You know, uh, the leadership role I think is important, especially because I I want to make sure that we're representing the, the profession good. At the same time, uh, our vision as wanting to be one of the elite schools in the country is got to be right next to that and I, and I think they both are very common points and uh, while I'm directing that vision I'm also you know deeply involved with the men's basketball team which now really at this level is like football I mean it's it's a it's a 52 week proposition of sorts um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at right now nice and you know with with that staff Bob so that's that's where I kind of want to go with you today is to kind of see, talk about what's happening today in the world of strength conditioning. Again, you know, you've been doing this for a long time and there's a lot that, you know, this is still a new industry. Um, so a lot has changed obviously since you were, you were with UCLA when you first started out. Let's, let's talk about right now, what just right now for you in your program design, what are some things that have changed over, let's say, like the last, you know, maybe five, five or six or seven years. There's so much going on right now. What, what has kind of caught your eye? What are some things that maybe you've changed? I haven't changed much in five to ten years, and really haven't changed much in fifteen to twenty. I think I've changed much differently than my first ten years. But I think it really comes down to to a few things, Anthony. It's understanding the sport understanding the movement and the needs, and then really coming up with a 52-week plan. I think if we do something that I really, really like and I think is an absolute necessity is every one of our coaches come up with a 52-week plan, a yearly plan. I don't know how you can coach unless you have that sort of plan. You have to have a, a strategy. So we, we come up with that. But in terms of exercises and all that, I mean, listen, the science isn't any different. The physiology of athletes has changed in hundreds of years. Now, what we know about that physiology and how to how to how to grasp it has changed a little bit. But you know, the the body is still been the body all these years, so that that doesn't change much. If you want to if you want to train for power, there's certain things you need to do that are the best ways to do it. You know, oftentimes, you hear there's many ways to skin a cat. Well, my response to that is, no, there's only one right way to do it, but there's lots of ways to to get there. In other words, I, I, I can walk from here to China, or, well, actually, let's just say this. I can walk from here to, to New York. I can still get to New York if that's my my destination and my goal, but I can also fly to New York. So both of them get me to New York, but one's better than the other. So, yeah, there's lots of ways to do it, but I really only think there's only one really right way to do it. And... um uh, that that part for sure uh, is what we try to stay with, and I'm and like I've said before many many times, basics. You know, cutting edge is great coaching. It's not any implement. It's not any computer. It's not athlete tracking. It's not a great bar. It's coaching. How do you coach? That's the key to getting athletes to perform. And doing the basics is the best way to do it. Like I said before, they've they've worked. They'll always work. They'll continue to work, and nothing works better. And I think what what if, if I was to say there's something that's really impeding the progress of coaches, and I would say mostly young coaches because they're exposed more to it now, is that everybody wants to take the express elevator to the top floor without really building a foundation that's constant, a uh, foundation that's consistent, and has been proven to work. Uh, so I, I really haven't changed much. Uh, um, I'm trying to really think now I'll tell you what I have changed over the last 30 years is I, I, we don't squat heavy twice a week. So I think that's probably one thing I like to go. I like to go heavy, heavy squats one day a week and then go one leg at the second part of the week. I still like to pull from the floor. I frankly don't see the value in going out of the hang. I like good squats. I like good bench presses and a solid 
group of supplemental exercises, and in the end, uh, you want to test and evaluate and draw your next program off that evaluation, not just say, hey, here we go again. We Well, well our average bench press went up. Let's do that again. That, that's not that's not effective. I think you, you, you have to test, and then you draw your programs off that. You shouldn't be guessing. I think I've, I've said it in print. I've said it in person. Uh, if you're not testing, you're just guessing. And uh, hope is a bad strategy for, for going for elite-level athletes. Coach, what about something, because you mentioned it a little bit, um, just talking about, you know, the technology right now. Um, mm-hmm. You have all these coaches that are coming up under you. You have a big staff. And, you know, we're all getting information. So with guys on your staff might come to you and say, Coach, you know, we're, I want to look at, you know, monitoring. There's a lot of new technology for monitoring. You know, how do you vet out all these things? What do you do as a team? What do you do uh, when somebody comes with s- some stuff that maybe uh, has been new? Do you make them just make a case for you and then try it out or you guys test it out? But for something like monitoring, for example, I mean, it's, it's a, we're seeing a lot more coaches doing it. You, ha- you certainly have a good, a good amount of staff that you could probably get away with uh, collecting some serious data and, and trying to use that data. Talk to us about, you know, about that piece of it. I want to look at everything. I mean, I want I, anything that new, new that comes out and my colleagues are using it and guys that I trust say it's really good. We're going to try it. I, I'm not going to buy it. I'm, I'm going to say, hey, if you want us to buy that product, if you want us to have that product, you think it's a good product, you'll give it to us and let us test it out. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, I think it's important to look at everything and, and to figure out how it affects you. But, but let me just say this about a couple things about tracking. One is, Strength coaches have been tracking athletes for years. I mean, I, I hope they are. I mean, I know there's a group of guys that, that, that aren't doing a great job at testing and evaluating and writing programs off of it. But essentially, I think most of us are, are tracking our athletes, strength, speed, flexibility. I think we've done that, you know, from the first day. So athlete tracking for us, everybody thinks it's this new giant cutting edge, which I hate to use, but cutting edge technique it's not we've been tracking a long time now the data that we can track there's more of that we have the ability to track more data so just you know looking at standard deviation um, looking at z scores averages and all those things that shouldn't be new that shouldn't be new to you if you're a strength coach you haven't done that in the past and you're doing your athletes a disservice so we want to make sure we look at everything and, and try it out but but and here's number two about the new technology i'll say if your athletes don't have good depth when they squat, if they don't have good movement, if they're weak, athlete tracking is a waste of your time. That's my example of, again, trying to take the express elevator. Let's, let's take a look at catapult, for instance. You know, we're going to put accelerometers and GPS on your back, but we have poor movement. Guys aren't flexible. They don't jump high. They don't run faster. They're not strong. I really don't know why we're going to put catapult on somebody when we're not there. That doesn't make any sense to me. So when you have the full package and you're looking at everything you're doing, I think that's a great idea. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I want my guys to bring me every single thing that's out there because I want it to help our athletes, and I, w- I don't want anybody to have a competitive edge on us. But we also want to be smart about it, and I think strength coaches really need to be smart about the data to look at it. I think have seen it before in print. Coaches are looking at data and misinterpreting it and, and making conclusions off of it or – Gathering tons of data and not using it any help, and not using it at all. And I, again, you know, my, people are spending a lot of money on these instruments. You'd think that you'd want to vet them and understand them the best you can. And so that's my take on athlete tracking. I, I, for me, I know there's a group of older guys like me that have been coaching 30 plus that say, I don't need that stuff. I, I, I know what I see. My eyes, my experience, blah, blah, blah. There's that group. And then I think there's a group like me that say, you know, I think I'm pretty good at what I do. This is even going to make you better. Why would you want to guess when, when you can get closer to uh, 100% certainty on certain things? I mean, I, I think it's I think it's great. I'm, I'm not going to dismiss any of that. I'm going to embrace the hell out of it. Yeah, and especially with you, again, with, with such a big staff, I'm sure it's hard to kind of make sure <laughs> monitoring, no pun intended, monitoring your staff and making sure that they're doing the right thing. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I want to take a look at it. But again, you know, when you have the data, I mean, it's not going to lie to you. You know, mm-hmm. if, you have, if you have a consistent approach to your testing and you have standardized your metrics, everybody's going to squat the same, or at least everybody on your team's going to squat the same. I'm not saying that all the football guys are going to squat the same as the basketball or golf team. Um, but within that team, I mean, we have to have a reasonable expectation of what that's going to look like. And then you have that, that intra-group testing. But as long as you standardize your testing and you look at the numbers, I mean, you can conclude some pretty good things about what you're doing. So I don't, I don't need to watch the tennis team every single day to know if what I'm seeing on these test scores are right. I'm, I'm trusting that my staff is doing a terrific job. And I look at the door and the numbers, and we can just look at the numbers and, and dissect them and come up with some, come up with some conclusion, conclusions on what we do next. So, um, uh, I, I think that's the standardizing all those testing and standardizing the lifts and the nomenclature. That's important. That 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 makes it a, a really good common thread to be able to to decide if your kids are getting the best service. Great stuff, Coach. On Shrink Coach, we've had a long running discussion. I talk about it with Coach Boyle a lot as well. Um, there's this, this Coach Boyle doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, you know him and I are good friends. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you there, there's this idea that you know maybe are we crossing the line uh, with uh, correct corrective exercise, quote unquote, and you know physical therapy, kind of getting into that area. Um, Talk to us about your take on this, because again, I mean, you've seen you've seen a lot of this change over the years. The, the, the physical therapist um, or some of these techniques that we're learning from people like Gray Cook, etc. Um, we've 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 learned more from them now, and so we we have this question. You know, are we crossing the line? And are our strength coaches trying to become physical therapists, and our physical therapists jumping too much into into our world of strength and conditioning? Talk to see your th- about your thoughts on that. There's got to be some cross-pollination in there somewhere. I mean, if you're going to work as a unit, a cohesive unit, I, I don't find any problem with, with an athletic trainer or therapist saying, hey, Bob, you know, that, that, that squat doesn't look right to me or this unilateral movement or that sprint, you know, maybe there's something that we can do there. I, I don't have a problem with that. But if I miss it and they can identify it and I can fix it, I think that's terrific. I know on our basketball team here at NC State, we all work together. I mean, we have – even the basketball staff and the athletic training, we cross pollinate each other a little bit. And hey, Ryan, I, you know, I saw so and so out there limping a little bit. And you take a look at it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, sometimes you miss things. But you know, let's 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 just <laughs> let's just you know talk about the worst kept secret in the world is how you know athletic trainers or therapists act in strength coach mode, or a strength coach wants to be the therapist and administer therapies i mean that's that's not what we're doing we have full-time jobs and you can't have two full-time jobs it's impossible to be present twice so there's a way you could probably go in that arena but i I don't i look at corrective exercises as a piece of the puzzle of helping my guy squat better bench press better run better jump better and all that i don't i don't see it as physical therapy much like if you saw somebody who was, you know, tight in the low back, you'd try to stretch it because we know what happens if your back is too tight in, uh, in, in a performance variable. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think you have to work together. I think if you stick to your job, there shouldn't be too much of that. Also, too, you know, in our world, even at the pro level, there's only so much time to do something. So to ask the athletic trainer to do corrective exercises, and therapies, and then send them to me in the weight room, sometimes that doesn't work out. So I have corrective exercises within my workout. It doesn't dominate it because it's not strength training. But at the same time, like all of us should be doing, is looking at what the priorities are in our training program, how much time we have to do it, what what athletes are doing it, and what's our what's our facility able to provide us with. And you just have to weigh out what you can and cannot do. There's only so much time to do a certain amount of things, and you can't do everything. So you you know you have to figure out the the the, the uh, in-house strategy of how do I get all this into one mix 
And um, sometimes it's enough, sometimes it's not, but uh, there is administrative liabilities. You know, like I said, time, staffing, education, skill levels, all these things are important in the coach. You have to you have to be real critical of yourself. It'd, it'd be just like it'd be just like somebody with no no expertise in teaching the power clean, but somebody who knows that that power clean is a really good exercise for vertical explosion, and then him just putting it in there, not being able to teach it. I mean, that's a waste of time. That's not that's not good. So it's the same thing. Like you know, so what do I do instead? I got to get my guys powerful. I'm not good at teaching the power clean. What do I do instead? Now, now that's that's cutting edge to me. Absolutely, good stuff, um, Coach. I heard in an interview you talking about you're trying to help your athletes build an attitude. As strength coaches, because you said, you know, when they get into that weight room, practice hasn't ended. There's, it's, it's still like an extension of practice. Talk to us about how our role as strength and conditioning professionals as well, because that's obviously helping somebody build an attitude. It goes beyond just, you know, writing a program and, and you know, talking about squats and, and, and power moves. How do we do that? I had somebody ask me the other day, you know, Coach, should we be – uh, responsible for, you know, teaching our athletes, you know, social skills and respect and toughness and all these things. And really my, my response is this, that, you know, our job is to create better physical profiles. I, I don't believe it is our job to teach toughness and social skills, but, but look, I think teaching it and being a role model could be mutually exclusive or, one in the same. So when I show up to work, my shirt's tucked in, I'm on time, I'm cleaning up my messes that I make, uh, I'm asking athletes, hey, can you please unload the bar? Here, come come help me, please. Those kind of things. I think those are every t- everything, every time you do that, I think I don't think kids can avoid hearing the commonality of that. You know, and all of a sudden it, it comes up in, in, in their way too. So I, you know, the, 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 the the attitude, I mean, I like attitude reflects leadership. And so if, if my kids don't come on time, if they don't do a good job, if they're disrespectful in their representation of themselves to me, then I, I, I shouldn't spend a whole lot of time moaning about them. I should probably take a look at what, what allows me to do that. You know, people act the way you let them. So just individually or as a team. So if people are disrespecting you, they do that because they can. So you need to, you need to figure out how to stop that. So, uh, you know, do I think it's our responsibility? I don't. I think it's our responsibility to be a role model just in general to your, to your kids, to the community, to your school, and just, you know, as a human being to, to, to be that way. And I think that, that should carry over. I think, I, I think that attitude carries over. I work hard. I come in, um, I work out myself. I'm in good shape, but you know, I'm not eating cakes and candies all day long. I mean, all these things are, you know, I mean, let's, let, let's face it, Anthony, all of us who are in this profession, it's a, it's a way of life. I don't, I don't know that it, that as important as an accountant is, I don't know if that's a way of life. You know I mean? I think our, our, our way of life is fitness. It's effort. It's get it done attitude, all these things. Uh, it's teamwork, um, and so part of that also has to do with you know, etiquette and respect and social skills and being able to talk to people and confront issues, con- confront unpleasant issues. I think those things are what would be great illustrations for young people, and I think young people need great illustrations. Yeah, that's a great point because I think – We've we've all you know even on on this show we started the art of coaching a long time ago with uh, Exos and Nick Winkleman and and uh, we talk about different things but uh, you make a great point about really because it's it starts you know the art of coaching starts with the coach and that perception as well and I like that you said um, you know if people are disrespecting you it's because uh, it's because you've uh, you've let you've let that happen so it's it's uh, so true. Wow. Um, yep. Coach, let's get into a little bit about uh, your specific just kind of philosophies with um, okay. 
the different in, in program design and periodization because you talked about that 52 week program uh, designing it. Talk to us about some things that you want to see. Let's start with um, with uh, with the off season. What are what's a philosophy for you? What's your what are your main goals in that off season? Well, I'll answer. But let me first just say this too. Now, the, the attitude that you spoke of as well, and I mean certainly not me representing myself as a role model, young people, and my kids, and my wife, and my family, and and to you in front of you, and all that. In that team setting, that also starts with the head coach. So, you know, again, it's, it's, you, you and I both know that it's really difficult to have the environment you really want unless the head coach is behind it. And I, I've been really blessed. Mark Goffrey right now here at uh, NC State, you know, all the, the head coaches at UCLA, Tony LaRusa in the big league, Dart Howe, uh, these guys have supported me beyond belief and are absolutely the reason why I am who I am right now. So that, that's a for sure thing aside from what it is I want to do. So let me talk about uh, the 52 week off season. Well, you know, that's when we're going to, we're going to start rebuilding and, and um, do what, what uh, was quoted in Michael Yesis's books years and years ago, the Soviet sports review. We're going to, we're going to dismember the training a little bit. We're going to back off and go back and reconnect with our techniques that may have kind of flawed a little bit. But really that's, that's where you sit down with the head coach before you get going along with your analysis and say, well, what, what do we need to work on right now? And then we go from there. So that's, that's typically the, the highest volume if you're going to have it. Off season in nowhere, shape or form says that you have to be high volume because it's off season. Nothing says that. Um, and we're going to probably have, you know, more frequency of training. The duration is going to be a little bit longer. And we're going to start working on the points that we essentially want to have come out at, in peak form in the competitive year. And so that, you know, there's really no hard and true template for that. Uh, with men's basketball here, now it's really easy for me because I have 10 scholarship guys um, that I can put individually trained so my, my 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 programs are individualized i know we hear that a lot but i will say this there's lots of coaches that like to say we individualize the programs and when you look at them they're they're not dissimilar they think it's individualized because there's percentages on there i can say this about my guys come visit anytime you want to watch my athletes cannot work on the same platform because their programs are so different so I have to have a separate platform for them, each one of them. And I'm just, and that's not me as much as it is. It's a smaller group, so I'm able to do that. I, and listen, I've worked with, you know, teams of 20, 30, and 40, so I know it's a little bit more difficult to do that. But so under those conditions, I'm able to really pinpoint on every single area uh, with some help from my assistants, and we're, we're able to do that. So that's the off season is just, I mean, everything we do, Anthony, in basketball, is for March, everything we do. That's our head coach's idea. That's my idea. That's been my idea at UCLA with the Oakland A's. You know, when we start four years out from the Olympic Games uh, with the beach volleyball team, the last two Olympics, we started in year one trying to peak out in year four. So that that's our idea. Our idea is peak performance at the end of that 52-week cycle. That's what the yearly plan is all about. Good stuff. Coach, I've, you've been, we were one of the first people that I saw argue about, um, this idea of maintenance in season. Um, (laughs) and, and just give us your rant on, on that idea. Well, listen, it's not a rant. It's, it's physiology. I mean, you don't have to, you can't argue the science with, you can't have your own science, right? It's like uh, Degrassi, the astrophysicist, who's really popular right now. Who I really love to hear her talk because he's he's much much more than that. But but he said, you know what? The great thing about science is that it's true whether you believe it or not. So you know, you can you can argue with me if you want, but you're really not arguing with me. So here here's my take: We're going to go in season. We're going to go heavy, all in season. Like so, with basketball, for instance, we're going to hit ninety percent four or five times in the 18-week period of, of in-season, 18 to 22-week, whatever it is. We're going to go super low volumes. 
and uh, you know ones and twos with some supplemental exercise because you can't you know you can't dismiss smaller muscle groups. Um, and, and that's my take. So here's here's what it is. If you talk to somebody and say, well, you know, we're gonna do we're gonna do sets of eight to ten because it is in season, and I say eight to ten, okay. Uh, well, doesn't that get them sore because of repetition, lactate buildup? Oh no, 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 no. We we don't we don't go max set for eight to ten. Okay, so it's a sub max way for eight to ten reps. And what kind of weights do you use in the off season for strength? Oh, well, one to five, you know, because that's where you build your strength. I say, okay. So let me see if I got this right. So in, are you trying to get guys bigger in season? No, not at all. Okay. So let's see if I got this right. So you do sets eight to ten. And it's sub-max weight. So you're not trying to get guys big because the weight's not heavy enough and you're not maxed out the rep range. You're not, you, you say you're maintaining strength, but you gain strength at one to five. So how can you maintain it at sets of, at sets of eight with sub-max weight? So you're not getting them bigger. You're not getting them stronger. And you're not even stressing the system. So what is it, what is it you are doing? And that's just, that's just physiology. You know, it just makes sense to drop the volume way down, go as heavy as you can, because it's going to be strength that you lose during a, a, a typical season in any sport. There's plenty of repetition. So baseball, for instance, is the one that was really guilty of higher repetitions during the season and lighter weights. We rep every single day. You're fielding, hitting, throwing every single day. Why would you want to put more repetition on? It's not as if back in the early 70s when we first started out, when I, like, for instance, when I first had crew, those poor sons of bitches, they, they – they 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 just got tortured by me, but they were the hardest working guys I've ever worked with, right? Yeah. So you figured out if you're gonna go two thousand meters in a in a race, and there's about two hundred strokes. So if I can get two hundred reps on every exercise, that should be just like a race. That's perfect. <laughs> I mean, that's what we knew then, right? Yeah. Like distance runners. So they're running that long, how many times they put their feet on the ground? I mean, we were on the right track and that's all we kinda knew. So if they ran that many times as that many footballs, we need to rep that many times and, you know, calf raises and all this other stuff. You're like, oh, it's huge. But if you go backwards and you think, Anthony, about what, we, what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to, we're supposed to give athletes what they need, right? What is it that a distance runner needs? They need more endurance? No. What are they lacking? They're lacking strength. Oh, that's what they should be doing. So a guy like Fred Wilt takes over, and he says, I'm going to have my distance runners clean, jerk, and snatch. Because that's what they don't have. They don't have power. They don't have strength. They're going to need squat, too best program ever so it's that same thing in baseball like what, what are players not having they're not they're not fatiguing because they're not fit they're fatiguing because they're not strong that's the key and so that, that's what i hinge everything on go heavy and go hard as you can it'd be i'd, I'd say the only thing that i would say you would have to be cautious of is that 90 percent during the season if you if you monitor it closely you're probably at around 82 or 3% just because of the season, right? So 90% for one or two, that, that's a pretty tough workout. It's not like in a regular workout where you'd get a couple of three sets of two. It'd be pretty tough. So that's that's all. But but you want to stress the system as hard as you can. And uh, whether that's, you know, just saying, here, let's look at a weight that, that you can only do for one, but not really a max, that's fine. But you, at some point, you, should, you just have to quantify it. So that's, that's just, that's not really a rant. That's kind of a definition. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Coach, um, let's finish up just about power. Obviously, again, you've worked with so many different kinds of athletes from you know, obviously 23 different teams in, at UCLA, but, but like, you know, volleyball, basketball, baseball. Um, give us your, uh, your, your philosophy on, on developing power and the best way really to do that and our, our, our best roadmap for that. I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, you got to be strong, period. And I don't care if you're a distance runner or a shot putter. Strength is going to be your base for developing power and speed. Um, and even if we, if we see now that everything is kind of climbing more that way, shouldn't be more that way. It is because I don't think enough people have adopted the fast, but now we're getting vertical jump testing in distance runners to kind of evaluate strength and speed there. So which we never would have done 20, 30 years ago, right? There would be no, no virtue in that. What, you know, distance runners, they have nothing. We know that for sure. So 
get strong first. And we know in younger athletes, that are developed athletes, getting strong first is power training. When they get stronger, they run faster and jump higher, period. Now, at some point, that levels out a little bit. So, doesn't mean, so what I'm saying to you is you don't have to clean and jerk and all that stuff right off the bat. In fact, um, let me think of a guy, Newton, Robert Newton, that has a great uh, lecture on YouTube, and uh, it's called Latest Techniques, I believe, which I show to my staff at least one time a year. But he talks about taking groups and finding out that you, know, you take a group that starts out with cleans and one that just starts out with strength. They go for eight weeks. The group that started with strength switches in to power training and go for another eight weeks. That group ends up stronger than the group that was doing what, what he considered power training earlier. The group that was working on strength training first was better. And we also find out that, you got to remember, too, the longer you power train, that is just, you know, cleans and jerks and plyometrics, you lose strength because the loads aren't heavy enough. So you got you can't stop strength training while you're trying to train for power. So the first thing you do is you just get strong. And then you just move into, you know, I, what I do is we, we start out with clean deadlifts, for, for instance. I'll deadlift. It's not, it's not strongly I feel about being strong off the floor and that. I will deadlift my freshman one whole year without doing any kind of uh, dynamic bar movement at all. Now, we, we might do some jump-ups and some, some very low-level single response plyometrics, but um, it'll be the next year that we'll go into high pulling. And if that works out fine, we'll move into cleaning, and then, of course, we'll kind of clean and snatch a little bit at the same time. But that's over the course of two, three years. So I think, I think you need to be really cognizant of developing good strength, good squat strength, and good strength off the floor with a bar. And that, that's really the, the, what I found to work. And then, of course, monitoring, you know, taking vertical jumps, looking at your testing. Are, they, are we making enough gains? Are they strong enough now? Is it easier to switch over to power training to increase power, or is it easier to get stronger to increase power? That's, that's that whole how strong do you need to be thing, right? There, there, is, there is an issue there. And at some point, when you start tapping out on your strength and your deadlift, it's going to be harder to go up 20 pounds in a lift than it is to shave off 0.01 seconds on, on a sprint or go up a half an inch to an inch on a vertical jump, and you have to you have to figure out what you could through the testing when that time is. Great stuff, Coach. Um, I've taken enough of your time today. You're on the road. Um, I'm so glad we were able to uh, to get you on. You've really uh, be, been uh, just a great teacher to so many of us, um, not only, obviously, your own staff, but to us on strengthcoach.com and many of the uh, strength coaches out there. So we really appreciate somebody with your experience uh, coming on and, and uh, giving us some of your wisdom. So thanks again, Coach. Uh, it's really nice. And, Anthony, you did a great job with this podcast. Now, you're the man. <laughs> you are it. You're the one that people are listening to, so that's good. And I, and I want everybody to, out there to know that uh, when you get asked, get on. Give us your views. I think it's important that we exchange views and have you know spirited and enthusiastic debates on topics because only good things happen. You either confirm what you already know or you add something into your program that makes you better from the tips and ideas from, from opposing views. So it's all good, Anthony. I appreciate it, man. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 178 of the Straight Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Barr, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. Check them out at performbetter.com. Coach Boyle and Coach Alejo for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Frank Dolan and Functional Movement System. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Kier Wynnum Flat for his insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. My name is Anthony Renner. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.